Uh, so welcome back. I'm talking here with Dr. Alistair Roberts about how we as Christians should be grappling with the questions that have been raised by the coronavirus pandemic, the response to that, the pandemic of um, fear and confusion and misinformation that has gone along with it. And um, one of the most urgent questions, uh, you know, that I think has been raised, uh, particular, probably I mean, particularly here in the U.S., where there's a strong kind of libertarian impulse, a strong uh, history of uh, separation of church and state, and I think very often confusion about what that separation of church and state means. Um, and likewise, claims about freedom of conscience, freedom of religion that are often um, thrown around without people really thinking about quite what they mean by them. So these have raised, uh, at least, there, you know, there've been several high profile stories. I think they're a very small minority of churches so far, but you know, a number of high profile cases of pastors refusing to comply with government orders to cease holding worship services. And there have been others, you know, there's a denomination that, that you and I are familiar with that is, that, you know, recently basically issued an ultimatum saying we are planning to start reopening churches soon, whether, you know, whether we're committed to or not. So there's two distinct questions here. Um, one is, as, does the civil authority have this power in principle? right? And then someone can have a power in principle and yet they can abuse it. You could say, yes, it is in principle legitimate for the government to close churches or businesses for public health reasons, but in this case, they're overreaching. So I want to tackle that in two separate discussions. So for this first one, let's talk about the question of, of principle. First of all, it's worth considering the realm in which different authorities operate. And when it comes to practical concerns like those that come into play in the case of a virus, the public health, the state does have a concern there. It has the expertise, at least in terms of its counselors, that the church does not. And so on that very basic level, it has the networks of authority and it has the networks of information that the church does not have. And so many of the church's instincts here need to be mm. held back because what the church is being required to do is something that, first of all, is being applied fairly equitably. The state is abiding by its own rules in terms of government meetings, for instance. And so if they're taking it seriously in terms of their meetings, it seems reasonable to expect the church to adopt the same measures because these things are being applied in an even-handed way. The church is not being singled out. This is not religious persecution. This is not something that's directed against Christians as a particular minority. This is something that is a more general policy that's being adopted for the physical well-being of the population. Right. And yeah, and that's important to note, right, that it's not, there's, at least for the most part, there may be some exceptions that we've seen, but for the most part, there's not anything religious, any kind of religious discrimination here. Um, it is not that a church is not being allowed to meet because they are a church. Right, which would be, you know, obviously the government interfering with religion qua religion. It's a church is not being allowed to meet because no one is being allowed to meet. And um, if we think of certain analogies here, I think we can um, realize that this is sort of obviously legitimate in principle. Right, I, I've used the analogy of, um, you know, Notre Dame Cathedral being on fire, and you know, presumably the Bishop of Paris would not have been so, you know thick-headed as to try and insist on, on holding a mass in the cathedral while it was on fire. If, if he had, then the, you know, the, the fire Paris, you know, magistrates would have been perfectly appropriate in restraining him from, from going in or allowing worshipers to go in. But you could imagine more plausibly, you know, the fire, the fire appeared to have been put out. Cathedral, you know, obviously it was, you know, kind of you know, severely damaged, but, but, seem to be safe and you could imagine the, the worshiper saying well we want to hold a you know a thanksgiving service here thanking god that the cathedral is not burned down but the fire department might be well aware that there are still very dangerous you know poisonous fumes in there there's ceilings that might collapse the building is still unsafe and they are authorized in preventing the church from meeting in that situation so it seems as if that that's the kind of reasoning that is being applied here right that you know unfortunately in this case it's not not any single building it's any building, anywhere where people gather together is potentially very dangerous. And of course, the crucial point here is not just dangerous to the health of the people there. I and mean, I think that's the point some people sometimes miss, right? People say, well, I'm willing to take the risk. Well, the problem is you're not just taking a risk for yourself, which would be the case in the fire. Like, fine, if you want to go in there and 
you know, risk a ceiling falling on your head, you know, to some extent, okay. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say okay, but more okay than in this, where the problem is you risk spreading an uh, infectious disease, which as we know, sometimes spreads invisibly and, and yet can be very dangerous to people. Um, and so it, it, it does seem that it, it sort of, it has to be in principle within the sort of just rights of the civil authority. Beyond that, I think there's also just the fact that if we do not have authorities that give us reason for action by laying obligations upon us when we do not have reasons of our own, we will not um, be able to act according to wisdom in many situations. Mm -hmm. And so we have authorities that do place obligations upon us. And those obligations ideally are associated with reasons and explanations. These policies are not just laid upon us with no explanation for why they're being placed upon us but the expectation is that we go along with these obligations these obligations are binding upon us even if we do not understand the reasoning even if we disagree with the reasoning simply because these authorities are over us and we're called to submit to them and I think that's one of the sticking points for many people the idea that you have to go along with this even if you do not understand why yeah and I think that's that's something I want to talk about in a subsequent discussion is I think this is highlighting our um, our loss of understanding of what authority means. I think we've often come to think that authority, um, you know, we, we have this idea of freedom of conscience and freedom of conscience means I'm free to believe whatever I want to believe. Some Sometimes it becomes parsed that way. And, and then it becomes I'm almost I'm free to act on any belief that I have. And therefore what that means is I am not required to obey unless I happen to agree with the policy being posed, or I happen to even un to understand all the ins and outs of it, which of course makes sort of nonsense in the notion of authority. Um, but I, I think that that's, that comes to a, a, a separate discussion. Um, there is something liberating about such authority if it's yeah. exercised well, even when it does place limitations upon us and prevent us from acting in certain ways. It, it does ideally order us towards the good. So if for instance, China had been more effective in regulating <laughs> wet markets or labs or whatever, wherever this began, um, we would not be dealing with this crisis. Now, we may think that the laws of um, European Union laws on health and safety or FDA requirements, that those are far too extensive and far too onerous. Right. But ideally, they're ordered towards the good and they're there for a reason. Right. And they're there in part so that we avoid situations like this. Yeah. Now, we may not understand why they're in place. We may feel that they go beyond, but the authority exercises its authority in these sorts of situations and places the ob these obligations upon us to order us towards a particular good that we may not be able to see otherwise. We're not experts in the mm -hmm. science, mm -hmm. in the epidemiology, whatever it is that is applying in these particular instances. And having experts that are able yeah. to inform an authority and the authority take action accordingly enables us to act according to wisdom in situations where we have no wisdom of our own. Yeah, I think that's a very good point about it being, as you say, liberating. That was definitely my experience. Um, you know, as a, as a school headmaster in the lead up to this, uh, I mean, it was tremendously burdening time in the last weeks of February and the early first weeks of March when I knew that this, this, this situation was likely to be upon us, that there was it seemed like probably it was going to require closing the school for a period. Uh, there seemed to be different testimonies as to when and whether you should close the school. And of course, the problem is part of those were aimed at, you know, public school settings, which is very different than, than our, our school, which was able to close, I think, without causing, you know, or rather to go online without causing great disruption. But, you know, the recognition I, I owed something to my stakeholders, to the to students and parents to try to keep the school running normally as long as possible. And yet, also, we owed it to the families at the school and also to the wider community to take public health measures. And being in the situation of knowing I had to make a decision, like whatever I did was making a decision one way or another. I couldn't just not make a decision, right? And the decision had important consequences, and yet I wasn't an expert. And then the point where the local, you know, we had, I finally had decided, you know, with my board to go ahead and, and move forward with closure. But then, around the same time, the public school district closed. And, and then shortly after that, schools in the state were required to close. And for me, that was a very liberating thing. It was just to say, 
this is, this is, this is a decision that really is too big for me. Um, and to have the proper authority giving us direction, uh, this is how we were supposed to act in the situation, it was extremely clarifying. I remember speaking to a pastor who said the same thing. It was a very difficult struggle with him, you know, and the church elders trying to figure out whether they should close or not. And then receiving direction on that was, was free, you know, because freedom, freedom is, doesn't mean being able to do whatever the heck you want to do. It means being able to do the right thing. And in a situation where it's beyond your expertise to know what the right thing is to do, then having authority makes those decisions is free. And that doesn't mean that authority is infallible at all or that we should never question it um it simply means that it's uh, we can't we cannot always be questioning every decision of authority that is that you know otherwise there would be more, no point in, in having it and we should you know we'd be like there in judges 19 there's no king in israel and every man did what was right in his own eyes and you'd never want to eat food from the market <laughs> <laughs> that's very true all right. So yeah, I think I mean I think I think that hopefully clarifies people the question of is this in principle something that is legitimate for the government to do? Yes. Um, and then uh, we'll we'll tackle the next discussion how you know in practice whether that authority is being used appropriately.